Hi, this is Misha. And I literally kind of found this rifle hiding in the back the other month. It was sandwiched in between a couple other things. And honestly, I thought I had sold from the store a long time ago because I had picked it up a few years back. So I figured we'd talk about it. I think it's only featured in one or two of our older bullpup videos. This is the Bushmaster M17S bullpup, chambered for 5.56 NATO, 223 rim, feeding from Stanag, AR-15, M16 mags, and it uses, like a lot of more modern guns, a hybrid system kind of inspired by and taken from Armor Lights AR-18, AR-180. And it has a really interesting history, actually. Also, an interesting cocking handle. But we'll get into the features and ergonomics a bit later. This bullpup was really the first American made of its type, being a bullpup, to be sold, offered on the U.S. civilian market, at least in mass. Historically, there really haven't been a lot of um, bullpups. And not only was this a commercial gun, it originally started off as a, as a military gun, at least as a potential military gun. So let's get into what came before in the history. The M17's origins lie in the late 1970s in Australia with a gentleman named Charles St. George who was the primary designer on a weapon we know as the leader, T2, which was also in 5.56. The leader T2 was a much more conventional layout rifle. In a word, it was Australia's AR-18. It was really the first design to really come out of Australia, period, and so they went with the AR-18 as inspiration because it was intended from the very get-go to be simple and easy to mass produce by nations who did not have, historically, a lot of arms manufacturing experience. Now, Australia, of course, made the Enfield rifle, the L1A1 rifle, and others, but these were licensed production guns that, you know, they had help setting up and they didn't design. The T2, on the other hand, was really one of the first attempts, if not the first, out of Australia. As a result, St. George went with as inexpensive and easy to use, kind of a square, tubular, honestly kind of gutter pipe like you'll see on the M17 type receiver shell. He also made his own rifling machinery to do it, since they did not want to or could not purchase from Lithgow. And he went with the AR 18 system for gas and you know non it, it didn't need a valve but was pretty much self-regulating and quite interestingly they used a three lug rotating bolt you know you see the seven lug with the ar-15 m16 and you see the two lug with the ak-47 but it had a three lug bolt so kind of in between and the reason they did this it gave better accuracy better performance, at least in theory, than the two lug bolt from the AK, but it was much easier, faster, simpler to machine, and honestly more durable. I mean, three large lugs, still more durable than seven small lugs. So it worked out well for them, and that was the T2. Now, I don't have a T2 here to show you, but a friend does that I sold them years ago, so I'm going to ask him later if we can borrow it for a video, because the T2s were imported into the U.S. as semi-autos briefly in the 80s, a couple of thousand at most. So it's an interesting gun. But that actually led to the forerunner of the M17. 
St. George would leave Leader Dynamics and help form a new company, Armtech, in the early 80s, which would kick off in 82, 83. A short time later, Leader would fold, by the way. And they would take the T2 design, at least the principles behind it, develop that into the M18, and the idea was to try to create a military rifle for trials in Australia. By the 80s, the Australian military was uh, kind of desiring something to replace the L1A1, for obvious reasons. And so the idea behind Armtech was to create something to fulfill these trials. It never really went much of anywhere. They had many prototypes, many things. What Australia ultimately went with was a version of this critter here. This is my pre-band Steyr AUG AUG SA. This is like an A1. And this was what Australia would ultimately adopt as the F88 in 1988. It is, as you see, a bullpup, also firing 5.56. We're going to compare these two in a minute, too. But that's what it ultimately won out and became, in a modified form, standard issue. In fact, it's still used in Australia today. There is the more updated version, the F90. Atrax is, is known in the U.S., the Lithgow. But back to the forerunner of this guy here, they tried a few things. They even tried a version, the C. 30R, which fired caseless ammo. They also developed the C60R, which fired 5.56 NATO. But unfortunately, in 86, they had a very widely publicized uh, out of battery discharge. A weapon um, blew up essentially because of hasty construction and possibly subpar construction and testing. And it, since it was such a public spectacle, there were many, uh, you know, many uh, spectators there at the time. But also, this was the time of video, and that pretty much sealed Armtech's fate and the, the C-30R and C-60R's fate and completely shelved any possibility of not just Australian military, but pretty much any foreign military adoption, which was a shame because there were some foreign militaries interested. So as a result, they would turn to the civilian market. Basically, the rights, everything would transfer over to another Australian company, Ed and Peen or Ed and Pine, and then Armtech would fold. Ed and Peen would update the design to the ART ART 30, and this was the direct predecessor to this. That would take over in about 1990, and Ed and Peen was aiming for the civilian market. But the U.S. had just passed the 89 import ban, so this is where Bushmaster comes in. Beginning in 1992, Ed and Peen and Bushmaster would enter in, into a partnership where Bushmaster would manufacture parts and assemble, do some stuff for Ed and Peen at USA, and they would market this as the Ed and Peen M17S from 1992 until they folded in 1994 at which time Bushmaster would take over the entire gun series, everything, and the Bushmaster brand named M17S would appear. Now this would happen just a few months, not even half a year before the assault weapons ban came in in 94, so there are very few true pre-ban Bushmaster M17Ss, but really it doesn't matter today because the gun was made domestically so a lot of the things for imports didn't apply in fact about the only thing they had to change for the band guns this sleeve this is actually a sleeve this isn't the barrel and the flash header is dogged down on it and this is actually what holds this front plate in and there for your barrel what they did they made a longer sleeve and then a muzzle nut on shorter threads to hold the sleeve on, and the ATF approved this as band compliant. So the original guns had a flash rider like you see here, an A1 style birdcage. Then they took the birdcage off and used a longer barrel sleeve and nut during the ban. And of course, after the ban, it was no problem to remove the long sleeve and nut and put a flash rider and a shorter sleeve or just cut down your existing sleeve. There was never a bayonet lug to worry about, and these could always take 
standard M16 mags because they were pre-banned at the time. Now Bushmaster would manufacture the M17S and keep it in primary production through 2005 but as soon, as soon as the assault weapons ban came off there were so many other designs coming onto the market new guns taking all new mags whatever competition was stiff and this was never a great seller for Bushmaster so they took it out of main production now it's worth pointing out that they would do tiny batches between then and about 2009 using up old parts but then that would be it and the final really chapter begins in 2012 with this gun when um, K&M purchased the trademark for it or obtained the trademark I should say and that's where the K&M M17S comes from and those started appearing well I know I transferred one for a guy in 2014 so by at least 2013 the K&Ms were around and every time you hear that K&M's done with the M17, they pop back up. So I'm not going to say never. But that's pretty much where the design ended. Now this was remarkable, as I said, in the 90s for being the first American-made bullpup to be sold, ATF approved, and sold on the commercial market. And it was very popular because it took pre-band type magazines, meaning you weren't committed to the dinky little 10 rounders from the assault weapons ban. So let's look externally at this versus these other guns. The M17S is 30 inches long, give or take what muzzle device you have on. We have a 21.5 inch barrel and we weigh a little over eight pounds, again, kind of depending on the optic you have on it. Speaking of optic, it's quite interesting. At the time when this was created, in the late 80s, early 90s, mid 90s, most guns were still heavily reliant on iron sights. If they had a rail, it might be it was the early days of Weaver rails and Picatinny wasn't quite in yet. So the fact that the M17 wanted a person to use an optic as a primary sighting device was pretty forward thinking, but at the time was often derided. Now it does have very basic, I'm gonna point this at you, iron sights built into the carry handle down below with a little trough but they're just backup sights it has a standard rail pretty rail short on top for something and i just threw a aim point knockoff from primary arms that i had around on to show you so it sits pretty high kind of like an a2 ar wood the charging handle you already saw it's kind of part of the carry handle to some extent now what's interesting, it's non-reciprocating and even spring-loaded. We have a release here. It's only on the left side, not the right. But the mag release is on the right, pretty well standard. AR-shaped. We've got the trigger up here. It's got a long link to the back. We've got a cross pin type safety. sling swivels pretty well standard this has a very long tubular type receiver derived kind of from the T2 has a polymer lower single piece from here to here including the butt plate essentially quite interesting so what else was going on at the time well when this was made here we have the standard M16 A2. Colt developed this around 82 to 85. It went into major military service in the 80s. It actually has a shorter barrel at 20 inches, so an inch and a half shorter. It too has a carry handle, more finely adjustable sights to be sure, but mounting an optic is e pretty much equally awkward. It's in no way really ambidextrous with controls only on typical side but the only kind of concession to lefties we do have the brass deflector on this guy so even though this has a shorter barrel you can see the Bushmaster is considerably shorter than the 
M16A2. So we are saving a considerable amount of weight, excuse me, of length. Weight-wise, they're about the same, frankly. Now, the only other bullpup on the market in the 1980s was the Steyr Aug. And most all of them that came over were of this kind of A1 pattern. We have a 20 inch barrel, quick removable. We have a built in one and a half power optic. So we are relying on an optic with this gun, but it is pretty much fixed to the receiver. No way to replace it. I'm gonna point this at you. We do have iron sights. Again, only emergency backup. The AUG fed from its own proprietary 30 round or 42 round mags. They are great mags, but proprietary. And after the 94 assault weapons ban, original AUG mags became very expensive. Before the ban, they were just expensive. Afterwards, they became very expensive. It doesn't have a external bolt release, not on the original, but it does have the bolt hold open. The mag catch is by default ambidextrous though, and the safety is a similar kind of cross pin style to the Bushmaster. This is a little bit of a lighter gun because of its heavier reliance on polymers. but of course much more expensive. Here we go on a length comparison. Remember the Bushmaster has a little bit longer barrel than the AUG again, but lengthwise they're really about the same with the AUG. Really they're almost identical. Yeah, I mean there's not enough to even really care about. The AUG seems like it's just a smidgen longer, but it is lighter. They're pretty much the same. And again, the AUG was what the Australian military would adopt as the F-88 in a slightly modified form. This was the only other bullpup available at the time in America, and it was vastly more expensive and took more expensive magazines, although frankly was constructed better, more durably. It too is a gas piston gun, although using its own system not one derived from the AR-18. Well, I think we'll get to a little bit of disassembly, don't you? Stop there. Alrighty. First, let's get our mag out. Like I said, one interesting thing, we have a standard mag catch here. We have kind of an early AR-style ambidextrous other side catch here, which is actually quite helpful being a bullpup, but the latch is only on this side. Similar to an AR, we have push pins. We actually have three of them. Doot. Doot. And we can actually remove the front one if we need to. That hinges down. You see you've got a kind of a proprietary hammer here. Trigger pack. This is that long link. There's a basically a piece of wire running all the way back to our hammer here. This is our lower. I think I will go ahead and move this front one. That make my life easier in a minute. Just like in an AR, you don't have to. It's just interesting, there's a middle pin. This one is quite a bit tighter, just because it hasn't been pushed out as much.
oh yes the front pin is uh, not captive it does have a spring-loaded detent very a la early M16 So now we have our inside. Like I said, this is just a piece of piping, essentially. We have a dual spring and rod setup here. Very AR-18. It's just held in by kind of friction. And you disassemble it. Then we have our bolt group, which is very... AR-15, excuse me, AR-18, square. Now Bushmaster would go back to the multi-lug, or I shouldn't say Bushmaster, but uh, later on Armtech would go back and Bushmaster would go back to the multi-lug AR-15 type bolt. Probably easy for manufacture here. And that is pretty well it. Our gas system, if we need to get to it, which we really don't, it's a piston. To get to it, it's up here above the barrel, we would further unscrew our flash rider, then we pull our sleeve off, then this plate comes off, and then our gas system can come out. And honestly, even from there, we can take our barrel out. It's honestly, at that point, just held in with uh, kind of screws, just Allen screws. And at that point, you just have a hollow kind of gutter type extruded tube. Have a fixed ejector over here. Have a deceptively simple design. Okay, stop there. And in theory, it goes back together the same as it came apart. The only trick is getting the springs and everything lined up because really just like on the AR-180, the receiver doesn't directly support the bolt group. That's really supported by the rails and uh, that's about it. It's very loose in there, which is good for reliability. It is indeed. Just an interesting gun that was, was kind of infamously well-known in the 90s, but has kind of slipped out of uh, favor just because of uh, them not being around much. I do have some personal history. I purchased one of these from Bushmaster. New, not this one, obviously. Well, I guess it was 2002, 2003. Again, because there were not many bullpup options. And at the time, pre-band AUGs, pre-band AUGs were very expensive. These were actually cheaper than AR-15s. That's one funny, uh, interesting fact. ARs are so much cheaper now than they were 10, 15 years ago. Even that's not even adjusting for inflation. Back then, a Bushmaster AR was around eight hundred dollars, and one of these was about six to six fifty. And that was for a Bushmaster. Today, a Bushmaster AR is is a little bit cheaper, about seven hundred. And then, if you adjust for inflation, you know that's <laughs> that eight hundred dollars becomes more over a thousand. So these were a little cheaper, interesting, and I, I did pick one up. It was reliable. Uh, it was my first bullpup, so I wasn't really, the ergonomics were different. As has been stated, this metal handguard will heat up. That's why the former owner kind of put skateboard tape on it. In, in addition to heating up, there's no real grippy surface. It's just smooth metal. So there's no way to really grip it except to have some kind of something on there. A lot of people will bolt on rails or put it on grips. But I think the idea was mostly to shoot this single-handed 
I also didn't like that sitting right here, you got a lot of gas, especially with certain types of ammo. You, you ended up sucking a lot of gas. And it just has a very simple, it's hollow, which is kind of odd, kind of corrugated. And you'd think this would be rubber, but it's just the same polymer. It seems like they should have uh, kind of gone to a gushy kind of rubber recoil pad because it's just pretty, un it's not ergonomic and it's not the most comfortable. On the other hand, the pistol grip's okay. Even though it's fixed to the frame, you can't really change it. It's at least reasonably comfortable and large. My first one had a pretty blah trigger. This one actually has a nice trigger for a bullpup. It's a little spongy, of course, but I've had worse. And releasing the mags, you can either use the left side, which is a little stiff, or the right side release, which is pretty standard AR. And the bolt release is pretty good because it's actually flared out, so it's easy to hit. Although I could see maybe someone, if they're really on it, hitting it accidentally, maybe. Sling swivels are just normal. I have a FAL sling on it. And like I said, there was no problem putting the flash rider back on after the ban. And of course, as optics became more and more common, this little rail on top became more and more useful. It is metal, by the way. The carry handle is polymer, but your rail is actually metal. And a lot of people don't like this uh, charging handle. It is kind of awkward, but at least it's non-reciprocating. It'd be fun if it was reciprocating, wouldn't it? <laughs> and it does have a dust jacket behind it to keep the action protected. I don't know. I kind of like it. it it's, it's that weird... 80s early 90s vibe it's one thing i didn't like about the k&m they got rid of it which i understand why they went to a side caulking handle but the way they did the side caulking handle as small as it was i actually kind of rubbed my hand and scratched my hand up so i wasn't really keen on the k&m charging handle they used so between the two, I kind of like this one, mostly for aesthetics, but also I find it more comfortable. A little weird, but comfortable. The K&M also went to a nicer trigger. Actually, a very nice trigger, but because of that, it had a lighter spring, and because of that, we found, Jay owned a K&M M17 for a couple of years, we found that reliability was sacrificed because the hammer wasn't hitting the firing pin with as much authority we were finding with certain types of ammo that had harder primers your steel cased and a lot of your military stuff you know m193 and 885 to some extent would not always ignite now with the more kind of sports match rounds with softer primers it would the k&m was more or less tuned for a target gun and it succeeded at that quite well. The M17 though still has a lot of its military heritage, a lot of loose tolerances. It was made out of inexpensive materials for the time. It's just weird. It's a weird kind of cool gun. And uh, we did that bullpup shoot a few years ago using FS2000, a couple of AUGs, couple of uh, Tavors in this and this honestly performed better than we expected it was pretty it would cycle pretty much any ammo type recoil was very minimal because of the eight plus pounds weight accuracy was better than you'd think because of the 21 and a half inch barrel it was a lot more enjoyable it's probably why this thing never actually got sold off after that shoot it was just kind of a cool weird gun and I don't know what these are going for today but they were They've always been pretty inexpensive on the used market, you know, $500, $600. So it's kind of a, an odd piece. I said I did buy one, I sold it a few years later, seeing them on and off. But yeah, that is the M17S. Began in Australia with Mr. St. George and had a couple of other companies between then and then. Got beat by the F-88. Actually got its ass handed to it by the F-88. There was really no competition. And uh, eventually wound up in the hands of Bushmaster. And today, the rights are in the hands of a company known as K&M. 
If you like bull pups, we have plenty of other videos on the other ones I've mentioned. And like I said, I'll try to get that Leader T2 that I sold to a friend a few years ago over for a loaner for a video because it's also interesting. I want to show you that three lug uh, bolt. It's pretty, pretty bizarre. Any of you who own some of the Barretts, they actually use a, a very similar three lug bolt too. Like I said, it is stronger. We really appreciate you tuning in. If you like the video, please click like. Also, please check out our Patreon page. This is Misha, and we'll catch you next time.